This is lecture six, and our topic today is gender sexuality in the body in global political economic context. So the idea with this set of readings and with this lecture is um, to look at the specificity of ideas and practices around gender sexuality in the body in particular places, but also to pan out and think uh, explicitly about the broader global context in which these examples are situated, particularly the, the broader context around um, politics, economics, uh, sort of the history of the world system, um, and understanding then how those broader forces both create and act on those specific sites, and again, the way people think about and act on ideas about gender, sexuality, and body. So that's sort of our, our broad umbrella of what we're trying to do in this unit. So uh, given that, I'm going to try to work through four major areas in this particular lecture. I want to start with the big picture and look at the political economy of the post-colonial world. Um, this is really to situate the cases that we're reading about in that sort of world historical space. Um, then we're going to look at three thematic areas that came out of this week's or this unit's readings. Um, gender, money, and power gendered cultural essentialisms, um, which I'll explain in a minute, um, and their re relationship to global politics. And then finally, gender and violence, um, and that includes both political violence and other kinds of violence. Okay, so starting with political economy in a post-colonial world. Uh, I wanted to make sure that as we look at these particular cases, we're thinking about the broader political historical setting out of which they emerge. And I think one of the most important aspects of that history that we need to always keep in view is the history of European colonialism in the world. Um, all of the countries that you're reading about, these cases, the articles and book excerpts that you're reading about are um, set in post-colonial spaces, right? So understanding that history, which still has a significant bearing on the present, I think is really important. So these two images are really just showing sort of the, um, the um, increase in the colonial project over the 19th and 20th centuries. The history of European colonization goes way back, much further than this, back to the 1500s, right? Um, so this is a little bit later in that timeline when we start to see significant portions of the world under a colonial regime. Um, this will also point out, I think, the ways that different world regions have been colonized and the differing timelines, right? So if you look at the map on the top, that's from about 1800, and you see that by that moment in time, um, much of the Americas is colonized. But the colonization, for example, of the African continent is still in its sort of early stages. That is, colonizing forces are on the sort of coasts, but have not um, you know, installed um, control of most of the interior. When we look then to 1936, we see a somewhat different map, um, a more comprehensive colonization that includes um, all of the African continent, or the vast majority of it, as well as um, most of the Asian continent. So, um, and you can see, you know, again, through the, the list on the left-hand side for the top map and on the right-hand side for the bottom map, which of these European countries are involved, right? So this project, again, from about the 1500s until well into the 20th century, of essentially carving up the rest of the world, claiming it for their own, um, installing governments, extracting resources, and in many ways profoundly um, shifting the social dynamics within those societies, and the relationship of those regions to the rest of the global political economy um, is, is what we're seeing unfold here, okay? So if we follow that timeline a little bit further, right, or look at it sort of in total, um, we see that, you know, again, much of the world was colonized 
um, during this long span of centuries. This map is actually noting when countries gained their independence from European colonization. So you see that, again, the timeline is quite different across a couple of centuries, some very recent, right? So the decolonization of some parts of, for example, Africa, Southern Africa particularly, is very recent, right, in the 70s and 80s. Um, so in general, we find that the Americas gained independence earlier than um, Africa and parts of Asia, but still that profound effect that the colonial project had on the world and on these particular countries and people is something that is absolutely a part of those societies today. And it's something that animates all of the ethnographic case studies that you're reading, right? So understanding the significance, for example, of what Goldstein finds in Brazil requires us to understand the context going back several centuries that led to the the current moment um, and the kinds of dynamics that we see around race, around gender, around sexuality, around class, right? So again, my idea here is to give you that just really quickly. There's not enough time to go into all the complex details of these histories, but to remind you of that historical and geographic context we're, we're looking within, okay? So as I say here, um, the the act of colonization by European countries established economic and political dynamics that continue to operate today, right? The world economic system, the world political system that we see in place today can be traced back to many of these relationships, these colonial relationships from centuries ago. Um, and also that decolonization, when countries actually achieved independence from European powers, was not the end of this story, right? So in other words, uh, decolonialization did not end the role of these global forces and these um, sort of structures that were um, established during the colonial period. And again, it did not end the kinds of social and power dynamics that we still see within these societies. So in other words, the legacy, the um, sort of the, the resonance from colonialism is still felt today in the societies that we're learning about, about through these ethnographic works. Okay, so that's sort of the very big picture really quickly. Uh, again, if you're interested in those histories, I definitely encourage you to, to learn more about them. Um, so I just wanted to zoom in a little bit more out of that broad history on, um, you know, some of the countries that we're learning about or that we're reading about in this unit's work. Um, so, for example, in, um, in week eight's readings, we have examples from Brazil, Madagascar, Madagascar, and the Philippines, right? So those are all contemporary ethnographies, right? Written in, you know, very recent times, right? Going back, you know, 10 to 15 years. Um, so we can't really, though, understand what's going on in Brazil right now, or even in the last 20 years without understanding that history. So Brazil was colonized by Portugal starting in the 1530s and gained its independence in the 1820s. Madagascar, right, remember in Cole's article, was colonized by France from 1897 to 1958. And the Philippines um, had two periods of colonization um, by Spain from 1568 to 1898 and by the United States from 1898 to 1946, right? So even though the formal colonization of these places is over, the legacy of that colonization continues. Uh, Brazil, in particular, I think, is a really um, important and instructive example to look at if we want to understand the histories of both uh, colonialism and slavery, particularly the Atlantic slave trade in the modern day, right? And I think the example that we read, the chapter we read from Goldstein, harkens back to all of that history and all of those dynamics. So um, Brazil's history is a history of the sort of dual roles of colonization and slavery, right? Very related um, aspects of their history, um, but distinctive in terms of what we need to look at if we want to think about Brazilian society today. So um, in fact, before we can even talk about sort of modern Brazilian societies 
um, we need to recognize that before the arrival of European colonizers, so before about 1500, there was a large indigenous population, right, of what's estimated to be two to three million people, um, and not a homogenous group of two to three million people, but uh, multiple, even a couple thousand different ethnic groups. Um, as was the case throughout the world, um, there was a significant reduction in that population simply through contact with Europeans, right? The, the bringing of disease um, that people were not um, able to sort of ward off um, was disastrous for many indigenous populations. Um, and beyond that, the marginalizing um, and exploitation of, of the indigenous people of Brazil continued that process. So there are far fewer um, indigenous people in Brazil today than there were at the time when the Portuguese and other entities arrived. So the Portuguese, um, again, started the colonial project as early as the 1500s. So this is a very long-standing um, history. Um, and as with other colonial forces, um, a lot of the project was about economics, right? Establishing lucrative industries that could enrich the European power. So in the case of Portugal, um, starting in the 1530s, that meant establishing sugar plantations. So sugar was a major export. Um, and to um, provide labor for that industry, uh, they turned to enslaving African people. Um, this was the Atlantic slave trade, and that was um, operating in Brazil between the 1540s and the 1860s. So an incredibly long and um, disabling kind of period of time. Um, so the first Africans brought to Brazil enslaved, that process started in 1538. And by the 1860s, 5.5 million Africans had been trafficked to that part of the New World. Um, again, this was in the service of industry. Sugar was an important one. Later, when um, gold and diamonds were discovered, mining became a significant operation. And if you look across the history of, of colonialism across the world, not just in the Americas and not just in Brazil, you find very similar stories um, about the kinds, of, um, the kinds of goods and the kinds of industries that were established and the ways that European um, countries uh, harnessed the labor of people either who lived there or who were brought there um, as slaves. Um, so Brazil, in fact, um, had a longer history of slavery than pretty much any other country. It was literally the last country in the world to abolish slavery. That didn't happen until 1888. Um, so in the um, early 1800s, Brazil gained independence from Portugal, um, but was not, in fact, established as a republic until after slavery um, was abolished. So it became a republic in the year 1889. Um, so again, this is a very, like, quickly sketched out history. There's a lot more to know about this. But I wanted to make sure we keep this in mind as we're talking about, for example, women, women living in favelas in Rio um, and the relationships they have, for example, with, um, with white men or men of European descent um, and the ways that ideas about race, gender, and sexuality um, intertwine. Um, and again, I don't think we can understand that well without understanding this historical context. Um, at the bottom of the slide, I've provided a link. Um, I'm not going to, this includes some photographs. I'm not going to show them here. Um, I think it can be um, challenging to look at images of people in a state of enslavement, but I will leave it there as your option if you're interested. Um, and the reason I, I wanted to provide that option is because um, Brazil's very long history of slavery, again, the last country to abolish it, um, means I think it's instructive for thinking about slavery in the world. And also, because it was so late to abolish uh, slavery, um, it overlapped with the early stages of widespread access to photography. So if you look at the history of photography, um, people didn't really have access to sort of relatively easy to use cameras um, until the 1880s. So in fact, there's a significant photographic 
record of the last stages of slavery in Brazil. So this is a link to an article that talks about that photographic history and provides some images. So if you're interested in learning more about this history, that's a place you can go. Okay, so again, this is background context. Let's dig in now to the specific ethnographic examples that we have for this unit. All right, so the first sort of thematic area that I'm gonna talk about is gender, money, and power in global context. Um, we've got sort of, you know, three examples that I think speak to this theme. We've got the constable piece um, about relationships between um, Filipina women and American men, particularly through um, relationships that are contracted long distance, often through the internet. Um, we have Goldstein's work on women in uh, a Rio favela, um, and again, looking at both how they sort of navigate their lives in the context of Brazilian society, and particularly particularly through all the um, really entrenched ideas and stereotypes, particularly about certain women and the role of relationships across both class and race boundaries. Um, and then the final example we have is from Cole, um, who's writing about um, Madagascar, and particularly um, the concept of love in, in Madagascar and how it's changed over time or is deployed in different ways by older rural people and younger, more urban people. So that's that concept of fitiavina and how the concept has changed over time. So we've got these three examples. And so sort of what I want to sort of bring out as an overarching theme, you know, as we look at each of the, the details of each of these, is that I think they all contribute to uh, challenging notions about the idea of a universal concept of love, right? Um, so uh, models of love, such as the ones we see in these three examples, that bring together sentiment, right, emotion, with material exchange, right, meaning money or resources or whatever, um, are often um, not part of the definition of love in places like the United States or in the West more generally, right? And that goes to um, ideas sort of brought in by Christian ideologies and other things, right? So, um, so these examples, I think, really challenge us to think about some of our ethnocentric ideas about what love is and what love looks like, um, or what the basis for something like marriage or relationships is. Um, and challenges us to think more broadly um, about a particular context in which both sentiment and material exchange can coexist and can even be, in fact, part of the definition of what love is in these other cultural contexts. Okay, so we're going to start with the constable. Um, and as you saw, um, what she is working on is um, Filipina women who connect with American men through sort of dating and marriage sites um, and the various stereotypes that are already existing and circulate about particularly the women, but both the women and the men. And really her goal here is to blow up those stereotypes and those assumptions. As she notes, there's a long-standing history of particularly um, stereotyping Asian women who engage in these relationships as quote unquote male order brides, right? And particularly in the case of Asian women, she notes that there's some very particular um, stereotypes that get put out, right? So the first being the idea of an Asian woman as, as docile or as um, passive, right? In some way in the relationship. And the other is sort of the opposite of that, which is the image of women as manipulative or sort of trying to take advantage in some way. Um, and what she's showing us, you know, both in terms of her discussion of her work and in the exact examples she provides us, right? In this chapter, we get a couple of example examples of particular people and their stories, is that it's actually not like that at all. And it's much more complex, right? In terms of who the individuals are, how they negotiate their relationships and what exactly the relationship is between, you know, again, quote, unquote, love or sentiment and um, the material aspects of those relationships, right? So she wants to um, 
challenge us to get away from all those sort of homogenizing ideas about who these people are and instead look at how varied those relationships are. That people involved in those relationships have, in relationships have different goals, different plans for their lives, and they have agency, right? When we say people have agency, it means they have the will to enact things that they want to do, right? So they're not um, so constrained they're, that they're not in a position to make decisions and pursue things that they want in their lives. And this holds for both the women and the men involved in these relationships. Um, so indeed, she calls that idea or that language of male order bride um, something she calls discursive colonization, right? So again, it's reducing women to objects, right? To be possessed by particularly Euro-American men. Um, which is both problematic in its own right and not a representation of what's going on, right? Um, so you see on the right side of the slide, um, indeed, there are um, sort of sites that advertise um, women in the Philippines um, interested in relationships, um, and she wants to push us away from accepting that stereotype. Um, so indeed, it's complicated to think about the power dynamics in these relationships. I don't think she's at all saying, you know, it's it's a utopia and these relationships are great and they're not embedded in these webs of power uh, because clearly they are. Um, so one of the ways she talks about it is that women are both resisting and reproducing those power relationships, right? Um, so in fact, um, the people involved here are not somehow stepping outside of that, again, long colonial history, the power dynamics between men and women, particularly between women of color and white men, all of that is still there, right? And the women involved in these relationships are a part of that system in a certain way. But even so, they are you know, carving out their own space for their own goals and plans. So there is also agency against that backdrop of, again, long-standing power dynamics. Okay, so that's that sort of constable's take on that relationship between sentiment and, um, and material goods or money. So the Goldstein example is at least as complex as that. Again, remember the history of Brazil that we sort of sketched out before getting to this. Um, so that history carries into the present all kinds of ideas about people, about particular people, about identities, about relationships, right? Um, and some of those legacies are explicitly discussed in Brazilian society, and some are not. So really what Goldstein's talking about here is the ways certain things get discussed and called out, and the ways other things remain implicit and sort of under the radar, and how that combination of things that are said and things that aren't said um, come together in the lives of women in poor neighborhoods in Rio. And she particularly talks about mixed race women because that is a sort of cultural symbol um, that has a lot of power in terms of how Brazilians think about themselves and think about their own history, right? So the way she phrases that, that sort of myth, right, that guiding myth um, in Brazil is the idea that Brazil is a colorblind erotic democracy. Um, and she says a lot of that, again, myth, because there's all, clearly um, both racism and sexism at work here, um, is that it, it's encapsulated in a particular symbol, which is the stereotype of the sensual mixed race woman, right? And that sort of image, that prototype, right, um, has become a symbol of the nation and of national identity. It's celebrated, for example, in um, moments as in the celebration of Carnival, right? So it's so embedded or so sort of entrenched in not only how people think about these specific women, but how people in Brazil think about Brazil as a nation, that it's all the more difficult to pull it apart and really look at it for what it is. So that's really though what Goldstein herself is trying to do here. So again, it goes back to that historical context, uh, colon colonialism and slavery, and the ways that those processes um, attach certain 
um, assumptions and stereotypes, particularly to the sexuality um, of people of African descent in the Americas, right? Um, the idea of black sexuality as being quote unquote other or exotic, different, and even dangerous, right? Those ideas are embedded in these assumptions about the sensual um, Brazilian woman, right? Um, it's also, especially in the colonial period, was used as a justification for things like rape and the commodification of women and women's bodies, right? So this very ugly history um, is part of what gets um, a little bit forgotten or papered over in the ways that people in the present talk about gender, race, and sexuality in Brazil. So one of the main things she talks about then is how all of that history and all those sort of contradictory ideas are played out in one very specific way through the women she worked out, she worked with, again, in the poor neighborhoods in Rio, which are called favelas, um, um, and their circulation of narratives, fantasies about the power of having a relationship with a coroa. And a coroa is a wealthy, older man of European descent, right? And that fantasy, which again is sometimes a reality, right? They, she talks in the book about how women sort of have had that kind of relationship or know people who have, but broader, more broadly than that, right? It's not just about having that, literally having that relationship, but that idea of that relationship um, is understood as a path to upward mobility, right? So in some ways, again, given the sort of major condition of poverty in Brazil and the, the women that she's working with um, are really struggling, right, in a day-to-day -day way. Brazil, not unlike the United States, is a very stratified society. So there's extreme poverty and extreme wealth, often side by side in a place like Rio de Janeiro, right, with a city, the capital city, where this is taking place. Actually, I don't think it's the capital. I think Sao Paulo is the capital. But um, a major city with, you know, skyscrapers and wealthy people and uh, the favelas, which are sometimes called shanty towns, where um, large numbers of impoverished people live, right? So that's also the immediate context, that class difference, um, which is also connected to um, to race, right? And to the, the colonial history that we've talked about. So given that setting and the difficulty of moving out of the condition of poverty, she finds that women actually embrace that role, right, of that stereotype of the quote unquote seductress or the sensual woman. Um, and the idea that there's power in being able to use that image in, again, possibly contracting a relationship with a Koroa and that as a sort of ticket out of their economic circumstances and as a survival strategy, right, for themselves, for their children, for their families. So there's a double bind there though, right? She demonstrates that these women clearly experience racism and know that they experience racism on a daily basis. And one of the sort of bargains that they make in pursuing these possible routes to upward mobility is it sort of disallows them in a certain way from overtly challenging racism, right? So this, again, this stereotype, this sort of national myth of the colorblind erotic democracy, right? Um, so that, again, sort of submerges outward discourses or conversations about racism and the way they experience race in their own lives. So that doesn't mean they don't have things to say about it. So this is where she brings in this concept of hidden transcripts. This is a uh, an idea that was first put forward by a scholar named James Scott. Um, and the idea with hidden transcripts is in power-laden contexts, right? We're in a society where different people have different amounts of power, often based on their identity. People with less power are not always in a position to call out the inequities around them, right? So that doesn't mean they don't express them, but they express them in more subtle ways. So those hidden transcripts in this case 
are the jokes, the stories of the Koroa and the possibility of the Koroa, right? Teasing each other, right? She gives a couple of examples of the women teasing one another precisely about this issue of race, gender, and sexuality in Brazilian society. Um, so, so hidden transcripts become a, an important outlet for people expressing these really difficult and disturbing dynamics and experiences, not directly, but sort of indirectly through these other kinds of speech. Okay, so our third example, again, under this banner of gender, money, and power, is Cole's example of ideas about love in Madagascar, right? And she's really talking about how that idea about what love is has kind of changed over time, um, particularly for young people, right? Who are now distinguishing, as she describes it, between something that they consider to be sort of clean love versus love for self-interest. So um, young people are thinking about two kinds of love. One which is sort of pure emotion, romance, etc. And the other that is about material exchange, right? What she finds though is that that's a novelty, right? That's a that's a transformation in people's ideas about what love is. Because the older model of what love is and the model that's still in place in more rural areas is that love always includes both affect, emotion, etc., and instrumental exchange, meaning the exchange of resources, right? Material exchange. So the idea that there's anything at all wrong with a love relationship that includes, for example, exchanges of money and goods um, is not at all what that older model thought, right? Um, so the sort of, again, older and more rural concept of love is one in which the exchange of goods is part of how you express love. It's what love is, right? And that is modeled on all kinds of relationships. So Cole talks, for example, about how relationships between um, people and their ancestors, right, or between parents and children have that material component as well as that emotional component. So that's not considered untoward or problematic or exploitative. It's considered what love is. So it's really these young people, and particularly urban people, who are shifting the definition, right? Um, part of where that shifting definition, that idea that you need to keep um, sentiment and material exchange separate, comes from um, Euro-American Christian ideas about what love is, right? So missionaries... Um, who came to Madagascar, put forward this notion of love that is the one that is more commonly in circulation in a place like the United States, um, that love is um, like completely without strings, right? That it's pure emotion, it's selfless, um, it's sort of beyond material considerations. Um, and that, again, had an influence in how people in um, society in, in Madagascar imagine like the possibilities of what love can be. Um, and indeed, part of it goes back to the relationship between uh, the experience of colonialism or the history of colonialism and current ideas or modern ideas about who people are and things particularly like race and class identity, right? So, for example, Cole shows that um, urban people in Madagascar, right, so um, people who are middle class or upwardly mobile in particular, want to uh, organize their lives more in keeping with some of those Euro-American ideals about things like love and marriage. There's prestige in that, right? Um, and that prestige is also associated with the French, right? Who are the, the colonists of Madagascar, right? So again, back to that initial idea that I spoke to earlier in the lecture, that, you know, it's these kinds of ideas and relationships did not disappear with decolonization. They still inform people's attitudes. Um, so it's hard, though, to achieve that idealized version of a European or Euro-American approach to marriage and family, right? Uh, again, because as we saw, the older version is about supporting one another financially and pooling resources in, or exchanging resources in certain ways. So the ideal of the couple that's completely separate from their family and is kind of living on love alone is actually very difficult to 
pull off in a context of low income or poverty, right? So again, we see something very parallel in a way to what's going on in the Goldstein article. Um, one of the responses to that difficult, like the desire to emulate that sort of love relationship or love marriage and the economic hardship of doing so, if you pull it apart from the material exchange, is examples of young um, women in Madagascar, young Malagasy women, um, putting uh, or um, entering into relationships with older European men, right, who can provide them, uh, who are of a higher class status, have more resources and can provide them with some of those resources. And then in turn, supporting their Malagasy boyfriends with those resources that they can um, get from the older European men, right? So in other words, there's what used to be a relationship that brought together those two parts has now been pulled into two, two different people, right? So these two different relationships are satisfying two different parts of what used to be a unified notion of what love is. Um, and, you know, and all kinds of, there's all kinds of interesting fallout from that, right? So I thought one of the really interesting details she notes is the Malagasy boyfriend who's being supported by his girlfriend because she's in a relationship with a, like a European man who can give her things like money, um, that he has a particular different kind of role in that relationship, um, that he in fact does things like housework that would be more likely uh, understood as the role of a woman in the household, right? So there's been shifts in those roles as this disaggregating of the emotion part and the money part has happened, particularly again for younger, more urban people in Madagascar. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our second big theme, which is really about cultural essentialism in the context of global politics, all right? And there's two things you read that fall under this umbrella, I think, the Abu Lugod and the Zakaria pieces. Um, and they're both really talking about global stereotypes and reactions to Muslim women, um, and in particular around specific kinds of activities, right? Um, that is wearing a veil, veiling, and the other is female genital cutting, which is always a difficult subject to talk about and one that, um, as you read, lots of people have very strong feelings about. So I think we have two windows onto complex issues that are very much sort of part of discussion. And I think both of them are precisely trying to get at that. There's a lot of talk and a lot of strong feelings about these things that often have the effect of making it less possible to actually understand and or support Muslim women them themselves. Okay. So to, to really think about these two examples that, that Abu Lugod and Zakaria present us, I think we really need to understand three related concepts, um, cultural relativism, moral relativism, and essentialism. These terms come out to some extent in these articles, but I wanted to pull them out here and just talk briefly about what they are, since they're all really important to cultural anthropology, and they're definitely really important in these examples that you're reading about. So cultural relativism, which we talked about way back at the beginning of the course, is a pretty foundational concept for cultural anthropology. And what cultural relativism holds is that if you want to understand a cultural practice that is not one you grew up with, that you are unfamiliar with, it's important in the first place to suspend your own cultural assumptions and judgments and instead try to understand that practice as the people sort of doing it themselves understand it. Right? So trying to understand the insider's view of that practice instead of projecting your own um, sort of idea or your own values from your own culture onto it. Okay? And, and I think a lot of all, maybe most cultural anthropologists continue to think that that's a really important principle, right? That we need to um, go into the world, not with our own cultural framework already in place and sort of putting other unknown practices or practices that are unfamiliar to us through the, the same framework that we use to, to evaluate behavior in our own society, um, and instead understand 
culture, right, and what is acceptable or unacceptable in culture to be to some extent relative, right? That's the idea. There's relativity there. There's not a universal or a standard rubric for evaluating what's the best way to do something, right? Now, there's another piece to this that I think gets kind of short shrift in these articles, and I think it's really important to bring out. And I, I talked about this also at the beginning of the semester, but it's, it's, I think, relevant to bring it back up here. That is the difference between cultural relativism and moral relativism. And as much as I think it's safe to say that cultural anthropologists mostly or entirely think that cultural relativism is a good thing and important, that doesn't mean for, again, all or most of us, that uh, that it's assumed that cultural relativism equals moral relativism. So moral relativism would be, um, in addition to saying, if we want to understand an unfamiliar cultural practice, we need to understand it as the people doing that thing understand it, is not therefore saying that we're also moral relativists about it, right? That we think, um, oh, well, that's how people in that place think about this. And so therefore it's, it's okay, right? Everything's fine. It's just how people do things in different places. That's a morally relativist position. So contrary to that, I think, um, you know, again, most cultural anthropologists both embrace cultural relativism and don't think that there aren't also um, universal, fundamental human rights that need to be um, supported, right, that need to be um, claimed. So things like... Um, violence against women or um, extreme poverty, lack of access to health care, right? There's some things that I think cultural anthropologists, as hopefully most people in the world, would assert are the right of every human being, regardless of their cultural context, right? So I think the important combination is cultural relativism plus um, a, an understanding that there are, in fact, basic rights that all human beings should be able to access, right? We're not moral relativists, in other words. Um, so when we talk about things like the role of Muslim women in society, in their societies, or things like the practice of female genital cutting, these, the combination of those two becomes really important, right? Um, so the final concept I want to mention here is the idea of essentialism, which comes out a bit, but for me is really central to understanding what both of these articles are talking about, right? So essentialism is the idea of trying to um, boil down a culture or a people or a particular practice to one thing, right? To one um, sort of label instead of recognizing the complexity and the variability of, again, that culture, the, that people, that practice, right? So it's, um, re it's a kind of reductive way of thinking about culture um, that um, it kind of takes a simplistic approach to understanding what's going on in a particular place, right? And often it's a really dangerous kind of reductive thinking because it allows people who are employing essentialism to make arguments about a culture or a group of people that are really not warranted and that continue to um, underline certain kinds of stereotypes about them or about that practice. So um, I think both of these authors are talking about essentialist thinking about Muslim women, about veiling, about female genital cutting, about the societies that they're talking about, um, and they're also then talking about kind of the, the limits of cultural relativism, right? So have anthropologists been good at sorting through these issues or not? Um, and how do we think about, how do we hold both positions of not essentializing and stereotyping people, but also recognizing um, and maybe supporting change about certain kinds of practices? So that is the sort of conundrum that both of them are speaking to. Okay. So Abu Lugod, um, who is an important anthropologist who's um, written a lot of different things about, about Muslim women and Muslim societies. In this piece, she's really taking on a very specific kind of issue, which goes beyond her own ethnographic fieldwork. It's, and it's also, if you notice the date, it's a sort of very timely response 
to a particular moment in U.S. history, which is 9-11, right? She is writing this in the aftermath of 9-11. And if you remember, some of you are probably too young to remember that, but um, that was a, in, the, in the aftermath of 9-11, that was also a time of Islamophobia um, and all kinds of both attitudes and practices um, that were detrimental to Muslim people in the world, including in the United States. So what she's talking about here is how, you know, in the period after 9-11, when the, you know, quote unquote, war on terror was being enacted um, and Islamophobia was uh, sort of very present, um, one of the narratives was that this war on terror was necessary or was justified because it was about, quote unquote, saving Muslim women. And it was saving Muslim women from their own societies, right? Um, so, in fact, um, for example, protecting Afghan women was used as a sort of symbol to justify an undergird political action, right, and war. Um, as Abu Lugod puts it, the idea was uh, to, quote, save brown women from brown men, right? So that, uh, again, that essentialism about things like veiling, um, was used as basically an excuse or a smokescreen um, to sort of allow for these other sort of political um, campaigns to move forward, right? So Abu Lugod here is calling that out um, and challenging those stereotypes and talking about the dangers of allowing those kinds of essentializing discourses to circulate, right? So um, reducing culture in that way is a problem, right? She says it ends up um, setting up uh, dichotomies like West versus East and us versus them. It's a form of what she calls colonial feminism, right? So this idea of, quote unquote, protecting women from the men in their society um, that has a sort of patronizing um, effect to it, right? Um, so um, instead of that, you know, she argues for and demonstrates, I think, in her article that there's a lot of sort of cultural and historical complexity to these cultural issues, including things like veiling. Um, so she encourages us to think more broadly and in a more culturally relative way about what veiling means from the actual people that engage in it, not through this sort of stereotype lens from the outside, right? For example, she talks about her own uh, thinking about the burqa and understanding it as what she calls, quote, unquote, a mobile home, right? So then, that in other words, um, wearing a veil is embedded in other kinds of social institutions, right? Like family, like home. Um, and it's not, um, as an outsider would think, um, something that limits a woman's freedom, or that's not, certainly not the only way to think about that, right? Um, so she's trying to say, if we actually ask women who veil about veiling, we'll get a very different perspective, right? And denying their own ideas about what they do and denying their own agency is something that's not acceptable, right? So that, in other words, um, the claim that, A, that Muslim women need saving and that things like war are going to save them um, is both a stance of superiority and it's basically also enacting violence against the people around these women. Um, so it doesn't, um, it doesn't hold true, right? It doesn't um, sort of, um, it's not very convincing as a framework for really thinking about people's well-being. So instead of that, right, she's saying we need to challenge that and cast that kind of thinking off. And instead of that, um, it's important, you know, in thinking about any people's well-being to, first of all, recognize our own complicity. The United States is complicit in the um, challenges in many Middle Eastern societies. Um, and we can also just in general, right, at people who are interested in other people's well-being um, can support the actions and campaigns of Muslim women themselves, right? Um, so it's not a point of... Um, uh, the sort of patronizing idea that we know better than people know themselves, 
which was that stance, right? Um, she mentions, for example, Laura Bush's campaign after 9-11, um, which was that idea of saving women who ostensibly are not in a position to assert what they themselves want, right? Um, so again, this is part of that idea of that es essentializing people, particularly along the lines of race, culture, gender, is often used in the service of global political agendas, right? As in this case, for sure. Um, I've included a link here that, again, I'll, I'll make optional if you want to read it or want to listen to it, which is just a short clip of Abu Lugo talking about her perspective on this. It's just a little sort of few minute interview. So if you're interested in learning more about Abu Lugo, you can check out that link. So, um, Zakaria is talking about something um, parallel in certain ways. It's definitely about essentializing cultures, essentializing ideas about gender and ethnicity, and it's connected to global power dynamics. Um, Zakaria is, in fact, not an anthropologist. She is a lawyer and activist. Um, so I put, um, you know, an image of her down on the screen here and some of the other kinds of things she works on. So this is another really interesting perspective, I think, to bring to the conversation. What she is talking about is female genital cutting, which she, from the beginning of the article, says is often understood as, a, uh, as an untouchable topic. She gives us the example of herself trying to publish essays about the issue and, for the most part, finding it impossible to find a venue for it, right? So I think, you know, we're, we're lucky to be able to read this essay in this edited volume um, in the sense that, you know, she's had trouble finding publishers who are essentially brave enough to write, to, to publish what she's writing, okay? So she, again, is working against or challenging and critiquing um, these essentializing narratives about female genital cutting which, as she suggests, often put forward um, a clear category of the perpetrators, a clear category of the victims, and a clear category of the activist heroes, who are often um, Euro-Americans or agencies coming from the outside, right, to essentially, again, as Abu Lugo shows, to save women from their own societies or from their own cultural practices. So, you know, as she says, this is, again, a sort of sleight of hand, there's a lot, in again, in common between what Abu Lugo and what Zakaria say. So she's saying it's a, it's a sleight of hand doing that, right? Because it actually provides cover for the policing of women's bodies in the place where these kinds of practices um, are, are happening, right? And that policing of women's bodies is coming both from the state, right, in things like enacting laws, and also from transnational feminists, right? Um, so sort of crusading against what is often um, in this article being um, uh, called FGC, right? That's the acronym that she's using for, feminal, uh, for female genital cutting. So from multiple vantages, um, she suggests supposed concern with the well-being of women and girls becomes a cover for uh, political, uh, for uh, entities inserting themselves politically into the lives of these women and girls. Um, the way that's done, the way that's accomplished, she says, is by framing FGC as, quote unquote, a cultural crime, right? So it's not about, for example, power dynamics within the society. Um, it's about um, the entirety, right, or the sort of global sense of an entire culture or an entire country, right? It's homogenizing, therefore, and essentializing. It doesn't understand sort of the details of why, when, etc. this kind of practice would be done, right? Um, so um, instead of thinking about it, you know, politically, socially, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it's understood as part and parcel of, quote, unquote, the culture of that place. So it, again, then uh, in that form allows for the furthering of Islamophobia, it again has that sort of colonial um, flavor to it, right? Um, like the colonial feminism that Abu Lugo is talking about. Um, it, it continues to, quote unquote, other Muslim women, right? Um, Orientalism is another sort of um, 
term that's often used for the specific kind of essentializing that is directed at Middle Eastern societies, right, or Muslim societies. So um, what she's trying to tease out, and the reason that she's found it hard to publish, is that she's not willing to come out with a generic condemnation of FGC, right, without any other discussion. And it's not because she thinks FGC is okay or not a problem or not that bad. She calls it violence, right? But she's saying if we really are concerned about this and we want to do something about it, misrepresenting it or refusing to understand the context in which it's happening is just inaccurate. It's not going to be effective, right? So she's saying if we really want to do something about this, um, we need to hear from the women themselves. And that entails understanding a whole set of complex historical, social, cultural components, right? Um, and not demonizing an entire society or an entire culture. So again, the reason she had trouble getting published is because there's sort of a knee-jerk reaction that um, without a clear and unequivocal um, claim to want to stamp this practice out, any other conversation is understood as being complicit with this particular form of violence. Um, so again, Zakaria, a very interesting thinker and writer, um, and someone you can um, certainly look at her other work if you're interested in these kinds of issues. The other thing I wanted to note that she points out is um, the ways that these narratives that, um, that have emerged about female genital cutting globally have ended up being institutionalized, right? So she talks, for example, about what's called Operation Limelight, which is part of um, the U.S. government's um, uh, Homeland Security um, office. And you see down there on the bottom of the screen, in fact, just the uh, image from the website, right? Um, and this is an ongoing project, which entails um, uh, officers handing, handing out leaflets against female genital cutting to people they encounter, families, particularly families with girls, particularly families and people coming from certain parts of the world, um, with this information, uh, again, against the procedure. So um, I think through that, she's demonstrating just how the extent to which that particular take and that approach or response to FGC has really saturated the world and become sort of the status quo response, and one that she's arguing is simply ineffective in its current form. Okay, so the sort of final theme here is about violence and gender, which has been a sub-theme of the other areas as well, um, but gets more explicit as a topic both in Abu Lugo's article, so I'm going to connect it here as well, and especially in Gutman's article, which is um, which is explicitly about violence and gender, and particularly assumptions about the connections between men and violence. Um, so, you know, we've already talked about Abu Lugod, um, but again, she's talking about violence and gender, and particularly about how these narratives are involved in war, um, and the ways that the quote-unquote war on terror was justified through this discourse about women um, and the oppression of women. Um, Gutman is looking at a different set of assumptions, and those are the assumptions that both that men are more violent than women and that male violence is universal. This um, connects, of course, to the previous reading that we did of Gutman about testosterone. It's from that same, it's from the same book, right? He has a book where he talks about various issues connected to ideas, cultural ideas about men and manliness. Um, so, um, he talks about some of the ways in which that assertion that men are violent in some inherent way are put forward. One is certainly in terms of the ideas that attach to the military, right? Which is highly gendered, as he notes, right? It's, um, it's primarily a male institution, um, and it's certainly understood in many ways as a marker of manliness, right? That figure of the sort of the soldier or warrior is an, a very powerful symbol in U.S. society, um, and it continues to um, further the connection between men and violence and manliness and warfare and all that, that kind of cluster of um, ideas that are intertwined. And it resonates with the public, right? One of the reasons that it's effective is that it makes sense to people, right? That people 
already have this set of assumptions about men and violence and war that, um, again, these symbols sort of feed into. Given all that, what he's arguing for here, which is, again, I think uh, another version of what he argued, argued for in the chapter about testosterone, is that we really need to not take this narrative at face value, but instead to, as he says, unpack naturalist arguments about war and about men's violence more generally, right? We need to push back on some of these inaccurate or certainly exaggerated claims um, about what men essentially are like and the degree to which some of these things we assume men are like is embedded in their biology and therefore something that is simply um, not something that can change. So this is his project in this article, is to challenge those ideas and sort of demonstrate where they run afoul of what we actually know about the world. So he's critiquing these assumptions. Um, and as he shows, you know, one of the challenges in critiquing these assumptions is that they're often biologized. So they're understood as part of male bodies, male essence, etc., right? Um, and that means it's kind of harder to dig them out because people already assume that they are inevitable or inherent, right? So testosterone, as we've already read about, is one version of that biologizing of men, of manliness, and of ideas like male aggression, right? So in the chapter, his chapter about testosterone, what we learned is, indeed, there is absolutely no connection between testosterone and aggression. It simply is not true. But it still has had so much effect because there's that ongoing cultural assumption that men are a certain way, right? And that that way includes things like aggression and violence, right? So what he's trying to do is say our default to these biological explanations, right? Um, it demonstrates this deep cultural commitment to seeing men that way. But we need to dig that out and look at it for what it is, which is a cultural assumption, not actually a, an effect of biology. So testosterone we've talked about. The other um, aspect that comes into this biology, biologizing of men, and particularly of men as violent, is from an academic field um, that's usually called evolutionary psychology. Um, and indeed, there's some very um, sort of famous and popular scholars in the area of evolutionary psychology that have had a lot to do with these assumptions as men as uh, about men as violent. Um, one of the most notable is Steven Pinker, and you may have either read or heard about um, Steven Pinker, who writes in a, a sort of accessible popular version of the findings from ev evolutionary psychology, and it has made him a best-selling author. So the he has and he has a lot of books. He's prolific. So the book that Gutman's referring to in this article is his book called The Blank Slate, which you can see here on the right. Um, and what he essentially argues in that book is that there is a biological basis for something he calls human nature. That is, how people act is precisely a reflection of biological evolution. That basically culture and history are not explanations for what people do, that it's just encoded in our DNA. It's genetic, essentially, right? So as a part of that argument, one of the things he says in the book is that um, essentially rape is an evolutionary mechanism, that it goes to the evolution. This is a basic sort of aspect of evolutionary theory, which is that you know, animals basically want to get their genes into the next generation, right? And in the case of humans, when paternity is uncertain, then um, that, that uncertainty leads to rape. Now, this is a disturbing idea. It's something that I adamantly reject, um, as I adamantly reject the field of evolutionary psychology. Um, I don't mind saying that. It, obviously, there are scholars and others, there are folks who teach in different departments who have a different attitude for, uh, about it. As a cultural anthropologist and as a feminist, I find it deeply disturbing and I reject it out of hand. I mean, one of the things you may have noticed in Gutman's article, which I thought was a nice um, sort of you know, internal reference within our course, 
is that Gutman quotes Emily Martin. Remember Emily Martin, who talked about the biologizing of women's um, reproductive systems, right? All that sort of negative language about menstruation and menopause. Martin calls out this Pinker theory um, and basically calls him a rape apologist, right? Um, so again, this is not just for me to get on a soapbox and talk about you know, my particular personal opinion about this, but it is to say that there is a powerful narrative about um, men's inherent violence and even more specifically men's inherent sexual violence or tendency to sexual violence that is not only embedded in the culture of our society, but is reified um, by things like Pinker's book, right? So Gutman is challenging all that and trying to help us think more critically about that assumption about the biology of men and the biology of men's violence. Um, so he notes, for example, that these um, assertions that it's basically in men's ev evolutionary coding to be violent and to be rapists, that if we look cross-culturally and just across space and time, um, we don't find universal rates of rape, right? If it were embedded in the, again, genetic code of all ma human males, we'd expect it to be more um, consistently distributed. And it's simply not, right? Some places um, rape is um, more frequent than others, right? So counter to what scholars like Pinker argue, um, Gutman suggests rape is not caused by biology, it's caused by inequality, right? And that if we really want to get at that, we need to reject in all the forms that it exists, this longstanding notion that quote unquote boys will be boys, right? So what he's calling out here is something that's often referred to as rape culture, right? Which is the many ways in which the ideas of, of these cultural ideas of men's inherent violence or cultural ideas of men not being able to control themselves sexually get circulated and repeated, right, in various forms from various places so that it kind of saturates our social world. Um, and it becomes a part of the culture, these assumptions about men and these assumptions about social violence. Um, so that is what needs to be called out and challenged, right, and um, rejected. So there's a few things he notes, right, sort of in terms of that, um, the idea, right, which we hear this still a lot, that, quote, unquote, men can't control themselves, right, whether it's in terms of sexuality, in terms of violence, whatever, that has the effect of making it up to women to defend themselves, right? So women then, that's one of the ways in which women end up being blamed for sexual violence perpetrated by men. Um, there's also, as he notes, and he noted this about the testosterone question too, right? If you recall from that other chapter, that there's also just a lot of bad scholarship out there that still gets published, right? Um, so the testosterone, as he, as he talked about in the testosterone chapter, that you know, people's difficulty in letting go of that idea that there's some essential biological maleness led to tons of research on something that simply isn't there, right? Likewise, um, he says there's bad scholarship on male violence and male sexual violence, and there's also misrepresentation of the better scholarship, right? So he gives that example of how um, a study that looked at um, basically tendency to rape as reported by college-aged men and came up with this sort of very disturbing large number that something like one-third of college men would rape if they could get away with it, right? Um, and he says that's a real misrepresentation of what that study found, right? Um, so the reason it's easy for that misrepresentation to have legs, as it were, is because it fits into a pre-existing cultural framework that associates men with violence. So again, he's saying the further we reify that notion or don't recognize it for what it is, the more examples pile on and make it seem even more like something that can just be taken for granted. Um, one of the things that anthropologists have argued, and particularly an anthropologist named Peggy Sanday, 
is that if we really want to understand sexual violence against women, we need to think about it in the context of the broader society, right? Which also goes to the fact that rape occurs more in some societies than in others. And Sande arg argued that the um, the amount of rape in a society is directly connected to women's position in that society. So that, again, it's about power and it's about inequality. It's not about men's inability to control themselves. Um, and the final uh, point that he makes, which I will note here, um, is that it goes also to how we um, evaluate things like political candidates, right? Um, he particularly talks about Donald Trump, who has been um, accused of and in fact convicted of sexual assault. And the fact that it seems at first glance surprising that a man who has been convicted of those crimes would even be a viable candidate, that in fact, he suggests, it is not despite but because of that behavior, right? Um, and again, as the um, slogan on the right side of the, of the um, screen shows, it goes to that stereotype, that cultural assumption about the relationship between men, violence, and sexuality, right? And that can be understood as a cautionary tale, like we need to be afraid of men. And it can be used as something to buttress men's claims to power, right? Like it's because of that association, it's because of that uh, tendency that men make better leaders, right? Um, if you're interested in that kind of thing, look at the polling about um, the two candidates and the degree to which people understand whether gender um, has uh, significance for political leaders and their leadership abilities, right? Um, so again, I think what Gutman's doing here is calling out an inaccurate narrative that's both popular and scholarly about men and by death and by extension about women um, and suggesting that if we really want to do something about these very problematic um, phenomena in our societies, the first step is going to be understanding where these ideas come from and how we can challenge them, not um, defaulting to biological explanations. In the testosterone article, he encourages us to take on a stance of bioskepticism. So I think although he doesn't explicitly say that in this chapter, I think that is where he ends on this particular subject as well. Um, and as we've seen, I think, across this semester so far, bioskepticism is going to be a very important stance um, regarding a lot of these issues. It's certainly something that um, Emily Martin encouraged us to take on. Um, so um, this might be one of the broader themes of the course that we're seeing reiterated here. Okay, so um, we've talked a lot. Um, I'll leave it there and we'll talk again soon.